Welcome to module 11, lecture number 34. Uh, we are at the fag end of uh, this uh, course. Um, after that, there would be the last module. Now, in this module, we are going to discuss about usability heuristics and testing. And um, before we start discussing about heuristics evaluation, about the tenets of usability in terms of how uh, you are going to ensure that uh, the, the product and the concept that you have developed are tested out with users, uh, we would first discuss about the information architecture. Now, if you remember, we did talk about information architecture in our last lecture, in the last module. And uh, before I ended the session with the prototyping and wireframing, I said that information architecture plays a major role in ensuring that the abstract content or the information that you would like to present through your interface is being visualized in terms of a structure, in terms of a skeletal representation and that in turn ensures that you proceed towards the wireframes and finally, to the prototyping phase. So, we are going to discuss about these issues in detail in this session. Uh, Let us begin. Now, see information architecture, uh, it is a science, it is a science of organizing and structuring content of web pages, uh, software applications, it can be web based applications, it can be mobile based applications and it can also be social media softwares. right? Now, information architecture focuses on organizing, that is the crucial uh, aspect of or piece of information that you need to focus on. It focuses on organizing, structuring lab and leveling content in an effective and sustainable way. Now, if you remember the J C James Garrett model that we discussed, the J C James Garrett model. James Garrett model that we discussed earlier during the initial phase of uh, this course, you would realize the role of information design uh, in that structure in the hierarchy phase. So, from being abstractions, from being at the level of abstraction where we focus on the user needs and requirements, we move down to more specific representation of those abstractions which are in terms of the interface. In between that phase lies the information design, navigation design and the structure plane. So, if you remember that uh, hierarchy, you would realize the role of information architecture in the context of interface design. Now, as, uh, as you can see here, uh, information architecture focuses on what? This is the important aspects of it, organizing, structuring and labeling content. So, when what do we mean by organizing? See, you need to understand that the, the concept that you have thought about, it is actually a medium through which your users are communicating with the system in order to ensure that their goal is reached. That is the most important aspect of what you must remember. And then you must also realize that these activities, this call to action features, the interface features that you use, that your, your use, user is going to use in order to complete that activity has to be arranged meaningfully, so that it falls in a structure. Now, when I say has to be arranged meaningfully, it means there has to be a structural representation of the information in a way that relates with the mental model of your user, of your end user. And that is why organizing and structuring and then labeling is important, because until and unless you organize the information into meaningful groups. You structure them in a way that they are relatable and then you label them, so that they can be comprehended by your end user. The 
structure of your interface or the offerings or the deliverables that your interface is going to provide to the end user is not going to fructify. Right? So, therefore, information architecture provides your end user with the structural plane to ensure that the information, the content, the call to action features are being delivered to them in a way that are meaningful, that relates with their mental model and they can have a meaningful interaction with the interface in order to communicate with the system. Now, a website or an intranet, I, well, you know intranet and internet are two different aspects of the web, uh, I am sure you are aware of that. Now, a website uh, or an intranet function, information architecture has two main components and these components are the site content and functionality and the relationship between um, the site contents and functionality and the information ar architecture that informs the UI. So, the main component, the two important components are first of all identification and defining the site content and functionality. So, in order to see that the concept that you have uh, conceived works, the concept must have some primary features, it must have some primary activities which uh, your user will use through call to action feature and then um, the, the goal that your user wants to reach can be achieved. So, um, correctly defining, identifying the site content and functionality is of paramount importance while focusing on the information architecture. Once you do that, the next important component is what? Define the underlying organization, structure and nomenclature that define the relationships between the content and the function. See, when we say content, we means what? You can see labels we mean see these are the things or these are the entities that helps your user to trigger a particular activity to ensure that a particular feature is activated and a task is completed. So, therefore, there should be a direct relationship between the site's contents, functionality and the structure nomenclature that you are using. So, the information architecture is not part of the on screen user interface. If you want to see it as a visual, as a visible interface feature, probably you won't be able to see that. But rather what we can say is that your information architecture informs the user interface. That means, it ensures what is to be presented into the interface as a medium for your user to interact with the system. So, information architecture aims at organizing content, so that users would easily adjust to the functionality of the product and could find everything they need without big effort. So, when we say this, we mean if there is a complete similarity between the mental model of your user with the conceptual model of the product, then adoption and delightful experiences happen. And it is the, the effort only gets increased if this happens. That means, the mental model of your user, whatever they are expecting, whatever they are uh, planning, whatever they intend to do, whatever the structure they have in their mind in their internal structure they have inside them does not match what the product or the software is, is, provi is providing. So, information architecture forms a skeleton of any design product or project. It is a skeleton structure. Remember this, this is very, very important word. It is a skeletal structure. So, visual elements, functionality, interaction, navigation all are part of it and are built according to the information architecture principles. 
Now, even compelling content elements and powerful user interface design can fail without you know meaningful or appropriate information architecture. Unorganized content makes navigation difficult and inexplicit. So, the users can easily get lost and feel annoyed. If the users face first bad interaction, they may not give the second chance to your product. You now understand why having an appropriate information architecture is so, so crucial for the adoption of the product. Because the moment there is an error, the moment there is something which the user is looking and he is not able to figure out through the interface, he is not able to complete the goal or reach his act, or complete his activity or reach the goal in the destined time that he has thought of, there would not be any second chance for the, that particular user to come back and use your system. And these are areas of concern because remember this is a market driven economy. The more loyal customers you have, the more return on investment you will have. right? So, let us understand now the main components of information architecture. The main components of information architecture are as follows. First, organization, schemes and structures that means how you categorize and structure information. Second, labeling systems, how you represent information. Third, navigation systems, how users browse or move through the information and fourth search systems, how users look for information. If you understand each of these things are so crucial to ensure that the users reach the goal, you affect any one of them and there is a breakdown, a breakdown that your users would not be able to reach. And when you look, a soft, look at a software, you would see that it is composed essentially of these main elements. It is a structure of information that have been categorized, classified into groups, right? It have been appropriately labeled. Then there have been essential pathways through which the users move which has already been defined and then in extreme cases where these kind of navigations are complex to figure out something uh, complex, the users use search systems. All these are the essential components of not only the information architecture, but the product as a whole. And you must ensure that you pay great amount of detailing in ensuring that the structure, the labelings, the navigation systems and the search uh, systems are accurately provided, so that breakdown does not happen. Now, the activities undertaking, undertaken in defining an information architecture involve some preliminary stuff and what are they? they are first content inventory. Now, it shows that information architect practitioners what content they have and where it leaves. Typically, you use a spreadsheet or a list. Then comes content audit, evaluation of content usefulness, accuracy because otherwise the, the concept of trustworthiness of them, the content will, will appear in the mind of the user tone of voice and overall effectiveness and then information grouping means definition of user centered relationships between content. How does your user relate between content A and content B? How do this relationship is defined? So, it identifies the relationship between the information. Apart from this, the next step important step which is very crucial is taxonomy development. 
Now, what do we mean by taxonomy development? See, by taxonomy development, we mean definition of a standardized naming convention, which is controlled by vocabulary to apply to all site content. See, the word taxonomy means it is a practice of organizing and classifying items based on similarities. If you remember card sorting, if you remember affinity, you will understand what do we mean by organizing and classifying items based on a shared theme or a shared similarities. This exercise typically follows the user research and content inventory processes. The information architecture might classify the items using categories, sections or metadata tags. Now, during this process, it is important to remember that the product's content and the functionality will grow. So, the way it is organized must be easily scalable. One of the fundamental properties of product design is to ensure that your product is scalable. Now, what do we understand by scalable products? We understand that over a period of time, the user behavior shifts. It changes if certain behaviors are met and then future behaviors are unmet. It moves from being met to unmet and that trajectory is what products generally want to take. If you see cars, you will see that there are similar platforms on, on top of which new cars are launched every 2 3 years in, in succession. So, if you have a particular model of car, it would be released a new model would be released with minor changes with some kind of additions of features into it. This is called scalability of product. So, you ensure that new features, new um, functions are added to the product, so that the customer base that you have for the product does not get disappointed if the existing product does not meet their ever changing need or ever changing behavior. And therefore, it is important that you define your practice or you organize the content in such a way that there is room for for scaling up the functions, features of the product in future. That is what we understand by taxonomy development. Now, you can see in the image an example of uh, how contents are being grouped. So, we have products, products can be toys, depth 1, this is first level depth, it has toys and electronics. At the second level depth, Toys have been classified further into educational, educational and plush. The third level depth, the educational toys have been classified further into card games, board games and puzzles. At the fourth level of depth is, board games have been classified into age groups and that is one set. right? Now, this is an example of a product taxonomy. This is how categorization structuring of information takes place. Now, apart from this, once the taxonomies are defined, one of the important steps there is to describe information creation. That means, definition of useful metadata that can be utilized to generate related links, lists to other navigation components that aid discovery. Once all these things are met, the final focus is then on creating hierarchy and navigation. Now, hierarchy and navigation are two very essential components that play into information architecture. The first defines the structure of the component hierarchy, while navigation defines how users will move through it, will move from point A to point B. Now, in order to create a hierarchy, the information architect needs to consider what the user expects to see 
based on user research data as well as how the business wants to show the information and that is based on the product requirements. At this step, practitioners think about typical scenarios of user to product interaction and use this information to design information architecture diagrams. What you see in the next slide is a classic example of a site map which is a type of information architecture diagram that tells visually denote how different pages and content relate to one another. You can see here there is a home page and these various contents are being listed here. Although the image is not clear, but what essentially it means that each page is designated here. You can see the main page here. From here there is an equal chance of the user to reach page B, C, 3, C, D, E, F and all these important pages can be also classified as functions or the features and each function has each sub depths, more depths to it. That is how an information architecture is created based on site map. Now, after this what is important for us to understand is how do you create your UIs. See in this course though it is beyond the scope of this course to discuss in detail about the visual aspects of UI design and the user interface design, but I will show you a repository of uh, good documentation of guidelines that would allow you to create user interface um, elements uh, according particular structure and uh, that would be very realistic in nature. So, let us uh, see that uh, repository. So, what I am going to introduce uh, now to all of you is the material design guidelines that is uh, a trusted guideline for all UI and UX designers. Now, this is uh, a guideline that has been brought to you by Google and uh, currently we are uh, going to look at the material design 3 guidelines. Um, if you type material.io which you can see here, you will get this page and this page is an exciting piece of hosts all exciting informations about user interfaces. You can go into components, if you click components you will see uh, the building blocks of uh, a user interface like application bars and bottom, how do you design that in the top, in the backdrop, you know banners, bottom navigations, buttons, just click on any one of them and you can enter. For example, you see that uh, this will contain the usage, for example, contents, a list of contents you can see about buttons, usage, anatomy, hierarchy, placement, text button. So, for example, you click on the usage and you can uh, read all these extensive documentations like buttons communicate actions that users can take. They are typically placed throughout your user interface in places like dialogues, model windows, forms, cards and toolbars, right. And the principles are uh, also explained here. For example, it needs, it, it needs to be identifiable which you can see here, uh, findable and clear and uh, how many different types of buttons you can see here. It is a text based one, it is a button that has a shape also, uh, but the shape is an outline only in, in behind it. Then you have a solid button with a solid shape and then you have the fourth one which is called the toggle buttons. So, essentially you have four categories of buttons like text button, outline button, contained button and toggle buttons and uh, text button are used to provide uh, you know low emphasis, outline one are the medium emphasis one, the content are the high emphasis one and the toggle button are the ones, it is a set of actions using layout and spacing are used for. And um, 
you can also check out the anatomy of the buttons. For example, you see here like the text button, the outline button, the content button right, and the toggle button, it is anatomy here, text labels right, like writing see all versus see all birds, how the levels are to be placed, then hierarchy, you know low emphasis, medium emphasis, high emphasis, right, placements, where do you put it, right. So, this is an exciting piece of information that have been presented, summarized and presented by Google and uh, this is available for free. All of you guys can um, look at it, uh, really re refer to it when you are designing for uh, the interface. Now, we are looking at the backdrop aspect where you can see the when, uh, how backdrops are used, what are the usages, uh, how the back layers are defined the front layers. Now, essentially, these material design layouts are, you can see these things uh, uh, very prominently in mobile screens as well as tablet screens, but this can also be used as a guideline for your desktop applications, you know. Now, uh, material design guidelines are being extensively used in software design as well, in standalone software. So, um, you need not think that these are only for uh, mobile applications, essentially this can be used for all uh, uh, types of softwares, be it web, be it mobile based, be it desktop based, anything, right. So, in case of backdrop, you can see all the principles are uh, related here, the anatomy is given, uh, the active front layer, how it has to be there, right, and um, sub header, how it is placed here, everything is given in detail, uh, active back layer, right. So, I would encourage each one of you to go through this important uh, piece of information which uh, Google has brought for all of us and uh, you can see how things are being uh, generally practiced in the, um, the UI practices that are being generally continuing in the industry. For example, date pickers, how do you have a date picker, what is the size of it, in, in which context it is being used, what are the principles that it should follow what are the anatomies, what are the hierarchy generally it has, all these things are clearly mentioned here. So, you ensure that you follow Google material design to its uh, fruitfulness and then you have a lot of resources as well as for example, if you want to uh, develop certain things, you have this uh, GitHub repos and developer tutorials also for that. Um, apart from that, you have uh, resources like material icons, Google fonts, color interface tool, color palette creator, high type scale creator, shape customization tool, all these things can be exp explored as well, right. Now, let us uh, go into the design aspect of it. So, here you can see material guidelines, if I click at the guidelines, what it will happen is that I will enter uh, about uh, the first principles about uh, sound, let me just check it out. Um, let me start with layout first, understanding layout. See, so now um, this section is devoted on layout. So, what are the layout anatomy, composition, right, um, application bars, navigation body, and then the body region, responsive column grid, right, everything is given here uh, in terms of the size also, the screen size. Um, right, navigation region, right, how do you compose containment, scaling with text. So, this is a very, very good repository for all of you to refer to and learn uh, the user interface uh, activities, uh, design activities and then we can also learn about navigation, no? understanding navigation which we have just discussed now. Uh, you know types of navigation, for example, you have lateral navigation, you have forward navigation, you have reverse navigation, right. And the examples are given very rightly here, the uh, contexts at which lateral navigations are used, some examples of it have been also placed here, right. You can see uh, the examples where forward navigation can be used, right. There are some examples for reverse navigation also, when uh, at what context it has to be used, 
when does somebody use a reverse navigation, so on and so forth. So, these are very, very essential and uh, uh, very useful tools for uh, your user interface design. Um, you also get uh, a good uh, repository on colors, you know, uh, majority of us are afraid of colors. I am sure that engineers I have seen, uh, including myself, um, we hesitate to use a lot of colors in our UI, but uh, we tend to keep it very uh, simple and um, uh, very pale uh, interface, but we will see here how co colors plays a major role in ensuring that uh, uh, the engagement of the user happens and uh, it becomes a delightful experience. So, the principles of colors are there, uh, the baseline materials, primary colors, uh, UI elements, right, secondary color, right. If you see that there are primarily two colors, the primary one and the secondary one that is used, um, colors which are used for active buttons, accessible colors, all these uh, different uh, discussions on colors are also here, right. Applying color to UI, if you go here, you can see, let me just see what design tokens in material design means. Um, it opens up completely a new site. Uh, this is probably more into, yeah. So, you can see the design kit for Figma, for the DSP implementation. These are all uh, source files of um, the software that generally are used by the designers. Let us go back to our main site. Now, here you would see all the principles of how do you apply color, identifying app application bars, right. Uh, what are the standard practices, blending an app bar with the uh, background, right. How do you do that? Then backdrop, what are the ways to do it, uh, sheets and surfaces, um, then model sheets, right. And then you have um, buttons, chips and selecting selection controls. See, so these are very, very unique ways of learning about the colors can access all these files and can learn about colors, right. So, uh, the, the motive behind showing you about all these things is to make you understand that uh, uh, this is a good repository for all of you to learn about uh, material design guidelines and follow it. See, primarily uh, your user is accustomed in looking at the user interface from these guidelines perspectives. So, uh, it is also important for you that you do not violate these guidelines, because if you violate these guidelines, th th then what happens is that uh, there would be immediate um, uh, disengagement and it would uh, happen because of your user not able to relate uh, the screens that, that, that you have uh, presented to him or her and what have been already he, been, he or she been exposed to. So, you do not want your product to be uh, a product that is uh, completely uh, irrelevant, completely does not follow any standard. So, in order to ensure that all these standards are followed and still you come up with features that are unique and uh, novel in nature, uh, you follow these material design guidelines. So, uh, though uh, discussing in more about the material design guidelines is beyond the scope of this course, I thought that I should talk about this in, in a very, very short way, just to ensure to make you aware of uh, these uh, guidelines. So, that if you are doing a project in this course, if you are doing, if you are learning this course and if you intend to design a software for this, then you, you see to it and see and, and make sure that you, your interface adhere to the guidelines uh, and the standards that are being applied in the industry. Okay? So, uh, that is what uh, uh, we, we, uh, we end with in this session and um, we will start about uh, usability heuristics and testing from the next lecture. Mm -hmm.